Pong? Everyone's heard of Pong. It's the first ever video game. Well, no, it wasn't, but it certainly was the most groundbreaking. Pong was the game to put video games on the map, bring them to the public eye. I know what you're thinking. Pong? This is so simple. There are only two colors. Well, yeah, but back in the day when it was made, in 1972, this technology was groundbreaking. The gameplay was simple. You, a white rectangle, hit the square ball to the other side, tried to score, while not being scored on. Super simple. Way back in 1975, Atari released a home console version of Pong for the Atari 2600. People were obsessed. Atari later went on to release even more groundbreaking games, some of which include Breakout, Asteroids, and the most famous, Space Invaders. Small innovation kept being made over time, with more and more games being pumped out left and right. Atari donned the crown, sitting atop their throne until a company named Nintendo came around with a little something called the NES. Nintendo Entertainment System. And along with the NES came a game called Super Mario Brothers. Where do I even start? Mario is one of, if not the most recognizable characters of all time, so Nintendo definitely did something right. The game was developed by Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka. Super Mario Bros. is one of the best-selling video games of all time, with over 50 million copies sold. This platformer was an instant hit, and remains a hit to this day. The gameplay goal is simple. Reach the flag before your time runs out but this game is anything but. Enemies littered the stage, along with power-ups, coins, and other hazards. I dare you to name a video game song that's more iconic than the 1-1 song from Mario. You can't. Well, Nintendo are still kicking, and they're still topping the charts with their games every year. Their games are always great, but games are for kids. They're a fancy toy. Well, it thought otherwise. This is a classic. It sure didn't invent first-person shooters, but it did bring them to life. Doom can run on anything, and has been ported to literally everything, from PC to calculators and even pregnancy tests. Doom was an instant game. When it originally came out, it was distributed as shareware for free. This version had the first nine levels from Chapter 1, Need Even the Dead. When Doom originally came out, it garnered a lot of attention. Doom was fresh, fun, and edgy for Samus back then. Government officials were trying to ban Doom because of its quote-unquote gore and violence. Doom was one of three games to push the ESRB, the ratings for video games that we use to this day. Doom isn't really violent for today's standards, though. Doom left such an impact on gaming history. 
even back then, when other FPS games came out, they were called Doom clones, not FPS games. And to think that the game that you play today, like Cold War, Warzone, all evolved from this. Doom contained a lot of hellish imagery and demons. There were tons of demons, pentagons, walls made of flesh, but all that stuff just looks like a wall of pixels now. Well, all this information is interesting and stuff, but how did the game play? One word. Incredible. Doom is an ultra-fast-paced, action-packed adventure, and it's just fun. This game still holds up great, and with a few mods, Doom can be transformed into a modern shooter. Oh yeah, and, and about that mods. Doom's modding community is booming, more than ever. GZ Doom is by far one of the biggest mods for Doom. It's a source port that lets you mess around with modern controls, settings, as well as making the game look stunning. GZ Doom also lets players run mods on top of itself. Some notable ones are Brutal Doom, which makes the game even faster and more, well, brutal. Project Brutality, which overhauls the gore, weapon, and movement. Batman.wad, which is an incredible map, and, well, Well, Doom is great. Well, where is the series now? Well, the whole thing was revived in 2016 with the self-entitled game Doom. And most recently, Doom Eternal as of 2020. A super brutal action-packed movement shooter. But back to the past. What came after Doom? And what was the huge leap after that? Well, funny enough, it was also made by id Software. The game was. Quake was the next best thing. It was similar to Doom in how it played, but unlike Doom, Quake was full 3D. Out with 2D sprites, and in with polygons. Another huge difference between the two games was the setting. Sure, it was still littered with satanic and hellish reference, but it was its own thing. It had highly detailed 3D environments with tons of platforming and enemies. Quake was dirty, darker, and grittier than Doom. It was worn corroded, and generally unfriendly looking with his environments. Quake's color palette consisted of a lot of browns, deep blues, and coppers. The best way to compare the two is with this quote. If Doom was thrash metal, Quake was somewhere between grunge and post-industrial. Quake was the birth of the FPS genre, the most popular of any game genre to this day. Quake played super fast, despite having less enemies than Doom. This was mainly because of performance, but having less enemies doesn't make them easier if all the enemies are super strong. The game required more skill than Doom, mainly because it wasn't 2D anymore, you actually had to aim up and down. The game also required more skill because many of the weapons used projectiles as bullets, for example, rocket launchers, the grenade launchers, and the nail gun, which replaced a machine gun. Most games have a soundtrack, but I'd like to think Quake has more of a soundscape. The entirety of the soundscape is composed by the band Nine Inch Nails, a very popular industrial band. 
In their honor, the logo was put onto the item box, used in every level. Id Software knew that if Quake were to succeed, it needed to have multiplayer. Deathmatch was huge, and was one of the biggest reasons Quake excelled and has such a huge following. Like Doom before it, modding was a hit. Quake's modding scene gave birth to many of the most well-known games and, well, thing to this day. Some of which include Team Fortress 2, which started as a mod for Quake, a 6v6 game mode with 9 classes to choose from. There was Scout, who was a really fast guy with a shotgun. Soldier had an RPG. Engineer could build turrets. Pyro used fire. Medic is the healer of the team. Heavy, the heavy weapons guy, uses mini -gun. Sniper, of course, has a sniper. Demo, which has explosive grenade launchers and spies. A man with a knife, one hit backstabs, and you will miss it. After the flight was invented, as a game mode, a bunch of racing, flight, and skateboarding simulators were invented as well. And the birth of machinima. Some may find that word familiar. Simply put, machinima is a show or movie that uses video game footage instead of, like, a camera, like real life. Red vs. Blue is by far the biggest example. Halo was used as a source material for that machinima. Made by Rooster Teeth, it really got their company off the ground. Let's talk about multiplayer once again. Quake was the first competitive esport to be played at a professional level. People loved it. What came after Quake's Prime, though? It had sequels, and lots of them. Quake 2, 3, 4, etc. Quake 3 was extra special, because of its engine. That engine also brought you games like Medal of Honor, Adelaide Assault, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, and the one that everyone can recognize, Call of Duty. Many, many things can be traced back to Quake. Another huge thing that Quake popularized was speed because of the demo feature that was built into the engine. By putting his little console command in, you could record the game and send it to your friends. Quake left behind a huge legacy, with all of its features and traits like bunny hopping, full mouse look, and 3D graphics. It was impressive and will never be forgotten as one of the best games of all time. As for now, id Software have mostly drifted apart to do their own things. Most recently, John Carmack left id in 2013 to work at Oculus and all that VR stuff. Overall, id has a huge legacy that continues to live on with Wolfenstein, Doom, and Quake. They are one of the biggest innovators in gaming. And shine, Mr. Ring Ring Ring. Rise and shine. Not that I wish to imply you have been sleeping on the job. No one is more deserving of a rest, and all the effort in the world would have gone to waste until. Well, let's just say your hour has come, come again. The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. So wake up, Mr. Green. Wake up. The story begins with young Gabe and Newell. He decided to split off from Microsoft to start his own company, Valve Software. Sounds familiar, right? Well, if you play games on PC, chances are you use Steam, which is run by Valve. Steam is the biggest marketplace for buying games and trading in-game items, by a landslide. The game opens up with a tram ride. 
During this three minute ride, the game sets the stage for what is a technically impressive masterpiece. The game puts you into the shoes of a 27 year old male MIT graduate who works at Black Mesa, Gordon Freeman. Freeman is a silent protagonist, a man of action, not words. Gordon dons the theoretical suit of armor, the HEV suit, otherwise known as Hazardous Environment Suit. But what good is a shield without a sword? The sword in this case is a crowbar. A standard red crowbar. One of the most iconic weapons in video game history. Up with a nail gun from Quake, as well as the BFG and Super Shotgun from Doom. The game plays great. It's super linear by design. Bunny hopping from Quake Return, huge. And if you don't map jump to scroll wheel, you're simply playing the game wrong. The game was teased at E3 in 1997. It ended up releasing in late 1998. It tends to be a trend with Valve. They always hold back titles, and sometimes even scrap full games if they feel they aren't ready, or aren't good enough. Always putting quality before quantity, otherwise known as Valve time. Upon release, the game was met with critical acclaim for, well, its compelling gameplay. PC Gamer gave the game a 97%, named the best shooter since the original game. Anyways. You, Gordon Freeman, show up late to work, so everyone's rushing you through to get you into the testing chambers so you can perform your duties. Today, we're just not the day to be late. In doing this, you cause the anti-mass spectrometer to have to start up faster, and when you push in the specimen, shit hits the fan. Standard insertion or non-standard specimen. <laughs> By doing this, you set in motion irreversible events that destroy civilization as we know it and wipe a huge portion of the human race. Nice going, Freeman. You are then tasked of getting out of Black Mesa alive, simply put. Half-Life is, again, super linear by design. It's also super fast-paced. Combat is decent. Enemies cannot move and shoot at the same time. So planning attacks and dodging is necessary to your survival. As you delve deeper into Black Mesa, you realize the company is much more sinister than it may seem. Along your journey, you will come across illegal alien weapon research, captive alien specimen, and even just nukes. The game only has roughly two cutscenes, one at the middle and one at the very, very end. Other than that, the game is all connected, with only load zones separating each area. Many people call Half-Life the birth of cinematic single-player games. With a game so successful though, it had to have a sequel. Oh, and it sure did. Many of them. Gearbox Software, a very familiar name to some. They worked on the Borderlands series most recently. Anyways, they were founded in 1999 and were hired to make expansion packs for Half-Life. The first one was made and it was called Half-Life Closing Forge. You play as a soldier sent into Black Mesa and you're tasked to kill Freeman. Another one of the expansion packs are called Half-Life Blue Shift. In this, the game puts you into the shoes of Barney, <laughs> this guy that greets you at the door in the beginning of the first and second game. Much like the first game, your only task is to escape Black Mesa alive. Mods. Oh boy. Much like Doom and Quake before, Half-Life's gold source engine was made public for people to use, 
many old Quake mods were ported and remade for the new engine. Much like Team Fortress, which became Team Fortress Classic, Day of Defeat, a World War II shooter, and the biggest of all, Counter-Strike. But more on that later. Second game took a while to come out, but it did. It came out in 2004, and at the time, and still to this day, it looks incredible. But along with Half-Life 2 came the new Source engine, which many people use as a development platform still to this day. Some of the most recent examples would be the Apex Legends and Titanfall series. Even though they are on a heavily modified version of the Source engine, it still is the Source engine at the roots. Now, story. You re-emerge after the events of Half-Life 1, many, many years after the first game. The world is in the middle of an interdimensional race war against the Combine, which is kind of, like, all of your fault. Later on, we get a Half-Life 2 Episode 1, releasing in 2006. It was a direct continuation of the events from Half-Life 2. In 2007, we also got Half-Life 2, Episode 2. Again, this is a direct continuation from the previous games. Unfortunately, there isn't a third episode. Valve just has trouble coming to 3 or something. With all of their games. Left 4 Dead 3 hasn't come out. Portal 3 hasn't come out. Half-Life 3, Half-Life Episode 3 has not come out. Much like the other games on this list, Half-Life left a huge impact, specifically on PC gaming. Because without it, we wouldn't have Steam the biggest marketplace for buying and selling in-game items, as well as just games on computer, by a landslide. Unlike other companies, Valve is different. They don't really need to make games to make money anymore. And they don't. Apart from Half-Life Alex, Valve doesn't really make games much anymore. They own Steam, and every purchase made on Steam, Valve gets a 30% cut. Valve has published some of the most critically acclaimed games of all time. Left 4 Dead 2, Portal, Team Fortress 2, and Counter-Strike. Yeah, I've mentioned that a few times before. It was a mod, right? Why am I talking about a mod? Well, Valve, a company, unlike other companies, acknowledges their community. A lot. A lot of quote-unquote Valve games were mods. For example, the Portal games. The original concept was made by a student from DigiPen Institution of Technology. When doing a showcase, Valve saw potential the students under their wings. Much the same is the case for Counter-Strike. Originally, a mod of Half-Life became its own thing. Its own huge thing. The game was different. Originally, Counter-Strike was made by two college kids. The game was a tactical shooter, a multiplayer one, of course. It's not like modern shooters. It isn't a point-and-click shooter. It's not always about shooting, and more about being strategic and using teamwork. You have to buy your weapons. It's been like that since the beginning. If you die, you're out for the round, and it would just take a few bullets to kill you. In the year 2000, Counter-Strike was actually acquired by Valve, from these said students. Counter-Strike, funnily enough, beat out Quake in 2000 and was the new competitive shooter that everyone played. It's a 5v5 search and destroy situation, counter-terrorist versus terrorist. The SWAT, or counter-terrorist, would try and defuse the bomb and hold out the bomb sites, while the terrorists rush in and try and plant before they all get taken out. Wanted. The terrorists can either choose to destroy the entire enemy team to win the game, or let the bomb explode, which takes 40 seconds. When Steam released in 2003, Counter-Strike was released alongside it. In 2004, Counter-Strike Source was released, a remake of Counter-Strike 1.6, but ported and remade. All the graphics were remade for the new Source engine. Better graphics, maps, and physics were added to the game. A lot of people didn't like Counter-Strike Source when it released because it was really, really buggy at launch. It was unbalanced. The, the Deagle was nicknamed the Hand Cannon for good reason because it was really overpowered. And the AK-47 was much like a point-click game, not what Counter-Strike wanted to be. 
The game stayed like this, getting small patches over time to make it a lot more playable, but most of the community just stuck with 1.6 or stopped playing. People loved Surf and B-Hop. Overall, they just loved how competitive the game was. CS 1.6 stayed at the top of the charts on Steam until 2012. The game that took its place was in fact Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Counter CS GO, for short. Valve this time around really paid attention to the competitive scene. When Counter-Strike Global Offensive first came out, much like Counter-Strike Source, it was a bit buggy, and a lot of people really just playing or continue to stick with Source, or 1.6. The game wasn't that huge. Until an update in August of 2013, they added skins and cases, known as the Arms Deal Update. Past this point, Counter-Strike has not left the top played on Steam, ever. Once. I think past it, in the near 10 years it's been out. Along with the August update of 2013, the Steam community market support got added to Counter-Strike, which means skin could be traded, money could be made off of skin selling your skins, and rarity of skins. A lot of people have made careers out of just gambling in-game and selling the profit, aka the skins that they get. Counter-Strike is one of, if not the most popular esport title, with over a million dollars each tournament that gets played, based in the pool. Minecraft. It's a name recognizable by all. Minecraft started its development way back in 2009. That same year, it was released as a paid public alpha, and it was super bare bones. Originally, Minecraft was developed by a single person, a recognizable name too, Notch, aka Marcus Person. The game got its first full release in 2011, and that same year, many people joined Mojang. That year was also the year that Jens Bergenstein took over, better known as Jeb. At first in Minecraft, all you could do was break blocks with left click and build cobblestone with right click. Much like Doom, but not to the same level, Minecraft has been ported to tons of stuff. Just to list a few. It's been ported to the PS3, 4, and 5, the Xbox 360, 1, and Series X. PC here, we have the Java version and the Windows 10 version. It's been ported to the App Store, Google Play Store, and Samsung apps. It's been ported just straight to the internet browser, Raspberry Pi OS, the Wii U, Nintendo Switch, the new 3DS, TV OS, Apple TV, Fire OS, Smart Fridges, and this is just ridiculous. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, this is also the highest selling video game of all time with over 200 million copies sold worldwide. In 2014, Minecraft was bought by Microsoft for $2.5 billion. Gameplay? Well, how did the gameplay? Well, you already know, so I don't really need to tell you, but here it goes. It played great. It's super simple to get into, and very complex if you decide to make it that way. Game is a 3D sandbox title, and this game hugely popularized that genre a whole lot. The game is virtually infinite, and procedurally generates as you travel through it. There's a day and a night cycle. At day, almost everything is peaceful, but at night, mobs, otherwise known as monsters, spawn, and most of them attack the player. This game, though old, is still super popular because of the many updates and community mods the game receives. Every time a new update comes out, the game is revived and everyone is playing it again, including myself.
Some of the biggest updates in the past is when they added the hunger mechanic, or the bedrock version was released, or even redstone was added to the game. But every update is something crazy awesome. The core game comes down to three things. Mining, crafting, and attacking. This game alone inspired many, many sandbox style games which are wildly popular now, such as Terraria. This game also sparked huge surges in the indie game development market. And well, you've probably played Minecraft before at some point, but if you haven't, what are you waiting for? Hop on in. Resident Evil is a franchise that's been with me since I was young. One of the first games I actually remember playing was Resident Evil The Dark Side Chronicles on the Wii. If I ever felt bored as a kid, I'd always fall back on Resident Evil 4. And sure, Capcom have milked <coughs> this series to death at this point, but still, I love it. So, let's go back to the beginning with Resident Evil for the PlayStation 1. This game lets you choose between two characters, Jill Valentine and Chris Redfield. Jill has a little bit less health than Chris, but she has two more inventory slots than him. Her total of inventory slots is eight, kind of like an easy mode. Depending on who you choose to play, the story will be a little bit different. As Jill, your partner and the person that you're gonna be running into the most along the story is Barry, and for Chris, it would be Rebecca Chambers. The majority of the game takes place in the mansion, a bizarre place infested with zombies, hunters, huge snakes, spiders, and even a shark. Resident Evil was the biggest leap for survival horror by far, and I'm gonna be real. The controls absolutely suck. They're super tanky, and it may just be me, but the game is really hard. Like, really, really hard to play. The original and director's cut version of the game all had cutscenes that were filmed in live action. Every single item in this game took up space in your inventory. Keys, weapons, ammo, increments, etc. Type raiders are used to save the game, a super iconic thing to this day. Capcom remade this game in 2002 for the GameCube. It looks great. The game still looks great. The game still has fixed camera angles though, and tank controls. 
It isn't full 3D, though it may look like it. The characters are, but however, the environments are just pictures with effects over them. It gives the illusion of 3D graphics quite well. This version of the game does earn the title Remake because it doesn't just remaster the game with new textures. There are new enemies, a whole new area of the game, and oh yeah, uh, zombies. They don't die anymore. If you kill a zombie, it will stay on the floor for a bit, but after a while, the zombie becomes a quote unquote super zombie. They now have more health and can move faster than the player. They do way more damage and they have a bigger range because of their claws. And now they're red? How spooky. The only way you can actually combat this and kill the zombie is once you drop it, you have to find some kerosene and a lighter. You must return to its corpse, pour the kerosene on the zombie, and light it up. Otherwise, if you kill it, it will just keep rising over and over again. This is the only true way you can actually kill a zombie in this remake. They keep rising if you don't. Another thing that's hugely iconic in this game are the load zones. And doors. That's what they are. There's an animation for every single door in this game. AKA a lot. They can't be skipped either, which is kind of annoying once you've seen 300 of them. Overall, Resident Evil has been a huge part of my life, and this game has had many, many sequels and spin-offs. As of making this video, there are eight mainline title games in the series. Resident Evil 1 through 8. But me telling you all of this information doesn't do the series justice. I strongly recommend checking these games out yourself. By date, putting this game on the classics list doesn't really make that much sense. But in my personal opinion, I definitely think it deserves a spot. The game I'm talking about... Bone Wars. I think that Boneworks is an instant classic, and it will be looked back upon fondly as one. Boneworks only came out in 2019, and this game is super long for a VR game, and it's incredibly revolutionary for VR as a whole, because like Half-Life 2, stuff is interactable with physics. But unlike Half-Life 2, everything in this game is interactable. Shelves, doors, cups, chains, boxes, trash cans, you name it. The game has a light story and it's entirely gameplay focused. It's a blast to play through, and everything about the game is great, except for one thing, motion sickness. The game gives you a real body, and it expects you to use it like one. You can't just walk through walls, and if you do, you're gonna end up getting pushed back, which is kinda gross in VR, if you aren't used to it. As the game states, it's for veteran VR users only. The game is infinitely replayable and offers infinite possibilities. It's just fun. That being said, the game is weird. And just how real it feels. When you take off the headset, you feel like real life, real life is just <laughs> Nah, I'm just kidding.
like pretty much all VR games, it doesn't translate to video well. Like, everything is perfectly to scale with my real life body, and things that you're seeing don't look that big, but they are life size. Another way to think of the game is like a big tech demo. Though it's not, it sometimes feels like it. With just how much it shows off to the player. The game feels like a big passion project, and it was made by people who actually want to be doing this. After playing through the entirety of this game, it feels like VR is come so far in the last 10 years. Like, it's just starting to scratch the surface of what it will be capable of in the future. And this game was a huge step in that direction, but that's just what I think. Video games are super cool, and it's interesting to look back and see what's evolved. What's pushed boundaries, and it's always interesting to see what will come. It's like a time capsule of sorts, of what the decade or the time was like, in a sense. I'm always excited to see what's going to be coming next. Thank you for watching.